Today we're going to do camels. Okay. So, um, what do we know about camels? Well, camels actually belong to the same order of animals, the same large group of animals that we talked about with hippos, and they are the ungulates. The one with hooves. Hooves, right. And specifically the even-toed ungulates, which are the artiodactyls, and we remember those from the hippopotamus. But camels are actually pretty distant from the hippopotamus. They're a branch, one of the first branches off that artiodactyl group, something called the uh, tylopod group, and then the family is known as the camelids. So um, the camelids only include camels and their distant cousins, the llamas or yamas, which we're going to be talking about a little later. So um, camels can be broken down into two kinds of animals, depending on whether they have one hump or two humps. So do you remember what you call a camel which has just one hump? It's called a dromedary. A dromedary. Right. And the camels which have two humps are called Bactrian camels. And the camels with two humps, actually only one out of 16 camels are camels with two humps. And the other 15 out of 16 are dromedaries. So there are a lot more dromedaries than camels. Uh, dromedaries are in this area over here in Arabia and the north of Africa and some in Persia and Pakistan as well. Meanwhile, camels are in Central Asia, kind of like um, Xinjiang area of China, Mongolia. Their habitat has shrunk a lot which is why most of the camels now are dromedaries. And in fact, there are a lot of dromedaries in Australia because they used to use them. They brought them over on boats from Africa and they used them a lot in the deserts of Australia. They were very useful animals for carrying stuff. But once they started using trucks, they didn't need the camels anymore and they just set a lot of the camels free and now they're feral which is kind of like being wild, but there's hundreds of thousands of camels roaming free in the deserts of Australia. Because like, because in the deserts, like, um, the camels like usually don't sink in it. They just like stay on top. That's why well, they're, like, they're adapted. They're well adapted for the desert. And we're going to talk about their adaptation and llamas are, um, the other, the other group that are in the family of camelids and llamas of course are kind of different from camels and they only live in the northern part of south america kind of the colder mountainous parts of south america like peru and ecuador and they fall into four different types of llamas the regular llama something called a vicuña alpaca and guanaco those are all the different kinds of um of llamas now the interesting thing about all camelids is that they originated when they evolved the first camels were actually in a place that might surprise you where there are no camels in modern times you have any idea where the first camels appeared on the earth africa no that australia. is where camels are now Australia is where camels are now. Asia uh, South is where, America? South America is where Asia? llamas are now. So actually the place where camels or the ancestors of camels first developed was in North America, where the United States is right now. There's and still specifically camels there, right? there are no more camels there. There have never been camels there as long as there have been people. They were gone long before people came. And they were in the area where now is South Dakota. And what happened to the ancestors of the camels is that some of them migrated, which means they kind of gradually traveled over thousands of years. And they crossed over the, the land bridge between North and South America into this part of South America. They became the llamas. The other branch went North 
And there used to be land connecting what's now Alaska with what's now is Russia. And they crossed over that land bridge, much like people did, except people were coming the opposite direction from Asia to North America. They became the Native Americans. But, long, but camels were going the opposite way. They went all the way through Siberia in the north. Some of them stayed in Central Asia. The two humps, they became the camels. Some of them kept going to Arabia and they became the dromedaries. And then eventually the, the Arabs brought them into North Africa, where now the largest population of camel, camelids is they are now one hump dromedaries. So let's um, watch a little video over here about the original camels. In 19th century Australia, English settlers set out to explore the continent's vast interior. But the hot, dry climate of the outback was too harsh even for the most resilient horses. So settlers and traders enlisted the help of another domesticated animal that was up to the task, the camel. Thousands of camels were imported to Australia to work as pack animals on expeditions and trade routes. They continued to cross the continent until the early 20th century, when they were effectively put out of business by the arrival of the combustion engine. Their services no longer needed, the camels were set loose in millions of square miles of arid desert where few animals could survive. And those camels didn't just survive, they thrived. Today, that feral population numbers over one million. With their wide feet to help them walk on shifting sands and their fatty humps to store energy, camels were famous for the adaptations that allowed them to flourish where most other large mammals would perish. But the fact is, camels didn't originally evolve in the desert at all. They didn't even evolve in Africa or Asia, where they live today. The story of the camel begins over 40 million years ago in North America and in an environment you'd never expect, a rainforest. The very first possible member of the camel family is Protiolopus, which appears in the fossil record about 45 million years ago in what were once the rainforests of southwestern North America. Today, the southwest makes you think of red rocks and cactus, but during the Eocene Epoch, it was lush, balmy, and very rainy. Protiolopus was well-suited to this environment because it was an artiodactyl, an even-toed hoof mammal whose members today include antelope, deer, and pigs. So you might say Protiolopus looked more like a tiny deer than a camel because, unlike today's camels, it walked on four toes, all capped with hooves. And Protiolopus also didn't have a lot of the other traits that we associate with members of the camel family, like long limbs and long, flexible necks. In fact, Protiolopus is so strange that it's sometimes put in a family with other kind of bizarre, not quite camel creatures called the Oromorisidae. So you'd be forgiven for not seeing the family resemblance. But Proteolopus is still considered one of the earliest known tylopods because it had many of that group's more subtle but defining traits, like having incisor teeth in the upper jaw and sharp tusk-like teeth in the lower jaw. And speaking of its teeth, there's one more weird thing about this very tiny camel. A closely related group of artiodactyls called ruminants have four chambered stomachs that help them digest grasses. But Proteolopus and his descendants have had to make do with less efficient three-chambered stomachs. So Proteolopus was more of a browser, preferring a diet of soft leaves and fruit over grass a preference that will play a big role in this evolutionary story. And as the Miocene went on, camels were definitely getting bigger and heavier. Megatylopus was one of the biggest camels ever at three and a half meters tall, which is a meter and a half taller than most camels today. And Megatylopus is also one of the first camels that we're pretty sure had that other famous camel feature, a hump. It had spines on the vertebrae just below its neck that were incredibly long, perfect for supporting a fatty muscular lump of tissue. Those fat stores probably helped Megatylopus as it paced across the ever-expanding grasslands of North America, acting like a snack pack in areas where food was scarce. But while Megatylopus wandered far and wide within North America, a close relative would be the first camel to leave the continent. Sometime in the Miocene, Paracamelus crossed the Bering Land Bridge into Asia, changing the course of camel history. The earliest fossils of this camel have been found in Nevada, dating back about 12 million years. But by seven million years ago, this intrepid explorer had already made it as far as Spain. Its fossils have been found throughout Europe and Asia, in places like China, Russia, Turkey, and Romania. Camelus, the genus of modern camels, was the first camelid to evolve outside of North America, and it and its descendants are what are now known as the Old World Camels. But they had to wait a few million years before their favorite travel companion hit the scene, by which I mean us. Once humans and camels found each other, both animals will be changed forever, because we domesticated them, but only some of them. About 5,000 years ago, humans in Asia managed to domesticate some members of the species Camelus bactrianus, the Bactrian camel. These are the double-humped camels that originated on the steppes of Central Asia. But there was a whole population of Bactrians that were never domesticated. And DNA evidence has revealed that, by 700,000 years ago, the wild and domesticated Bactrians had diverged enough that they had become two species. 
Today, only about 1,400 wild Bactrians are still alive, the only truly wild members of the Camelus genus. And around the same time that Bactrians were becoming domesticated in Asia, another species, the dromedaries, were starting to be used by humans around the Arabian Peninsula and the Horn of Africa. Those dromedary camels are the species that was sent to Australia in the 1800s. But Old World camels aren't the only members of the camelid family, and they're not the only ones that we have domesticated. While relatives of Old World camels were roaming the Arctic three million years ago, another one was traveling in a different direction. Members of a genus known as Hemiachenia left North America to go check out South America, which had recently become connected by a land bridge. And Hemiachenia likely became the direct ancestor of all of South America's camelids. This includes the wild guanacos, which eventually gave rise to the llama, and the wild vicuña, from which alpacas are descended. So, we're gonna talk about how, what changed in camels that allows them to survive in the desert. Now, what is different about the desert from, say, a jungle or a savanna? What is special about a desert? Yes, Ian? Uh, there's no water. Right, so it's very dry. There's no water. And then what's the other thing about the Sahara Desert? They have no trees. trees. Not that much no trees. trees, and there's not much to eat, right? There's no water, there's very little plants to eat, and it is also very hot. Hot. So camels had to adapt to little food around, very dry and very hot. So what we call it when new when animals change over time they evolve it's the process is called adaptation right so it's hard for the animals to survive in the desert but every camel baby is a little bit different and some of those differences make those camel babies more likely to live and have their own babies than other camels and when those camels have their own babies they have those same what we call traits those same features that their parents had, and those features become the normal features of camels. That is the process of adaptation that takes hundreds of thousands or millions of years to take place. So what are some of the adaptations of camels? Well, what's the most obvious thing that a camel has that no other animal has? Humps. Humps, right? So everybody knows camels by their humps. And you know what's in those humps? It's not water. Oh. Some people think it's water. It's basically food, but it's fat. Food gets stored in animal bodies as fat. So they store fat in their humps. Oh, like, like they even store water in their humps. Well, they don't store water in their humps. Some people think that they store water in their humps, but actually it is fat. However, there is water in fat and they can generate water from melting down the fat in, um, the fat in their humps. So camels can, however, keep water all over their bodies and they can go 10 days without water. When they do find water and they drink, they can drink an enormous amount. 53 gallons. That's something like a whole bathtub full of water that they can drink in one spot. And other animals, or certainly humans, if they tried to drink that much water, you know what would happen to them? Puke. Well, they would probably puke, but if they, they didn't puke, the really they would die. Because if you drink too much water too fast, it messes up the salt balance in your body. And when you mess up the salt balance in your body, it injures your brain, it injures your blood. So camels have specialized blood, specialized brains, so that those kind of changes in the salt balance don't cause damage. Um, even Their blood is also special in the shape of their red blood cells are a different shape, so that when they get very dry and their blood gets thicker because there's not as much water in it, Another animal, the blood might stop flowing, um, but uh, in a camel, it keeps flowing because the shape of their red blood cells makes them roll over each other easily. Uh, when camels sweat, they sweat very, very little. Sweating is important for losing heat 
because the heat inside the body heats up the water and makes it evaporate into the air. So the water on the surface of the body takes, takes away the heat out of the body. Um, they also hold on to water that another animal would lose. So when we breathe, a lot of water vapor comes out. Camels bring that water back into their bodies through their nostrils, where other animals just lose it. Uh, they um, also have specialized kidneys. You remember what the kidneys do. The kidneys decide how much water you're gonna save and they get rid of waste. Camels can get rid of the waste in their blood with a lot less water than other animals. And when they pee, it comes out really thick, almost like maple syrup, not like the pee of other animals. And when they poop, their poop is very dry as well. Uh, they have actually a thick coat that you think would make them hotter, but actually the thick coat prevents the heat from the sun from getting into their bodies. It's insulation against heat. And they also have a very those very long eyelashes they have. You know what those are for? Cover their eyes? They are, but what are they trying to keep out of their eyes? The sun. The sun and also the sand, because there's a lot of sand blowing around in the desert. And they even have a third eyelid to help keep their eyelid closed in sandstorms. Let's watch, this one's only a minute long. We're gonna watch a video about adaptations of camels. Camels are very well adapted to live in the desert, which is hot and dry during the day, but cold at night. They have adapted thick fur on the top of their body for shade, but thin fur everywhere else to maximize heat loss. A large surface area to volume ratio also helps to keep them cool because heat has more places to escape from. But camels have adapted to tolerate body temperatures of up to 42 degrees Celsius. It's actually a myth that camels can store water in their humps, but they can go for a very long time without drinking water, and they can drink up to 46 litres in one session. They lose very little water through perspiration because their body temperature changes throughout the day, so there is no need to perspire. They also lose very little through urination because their kidneys concentrate urine. Their hump is actually a fat store which can be respired to release water and this allows them to go a long time without food which is scarce. Camels have adapted to have very large flat feet to spread their weight on the sand and the skin between their toes helps to stop them sinking. They also have two sets of eyelashes and large slit like nostrils to keep the sand away from their face. Another important difference between camels and the other animals, uh, or the animal that we last talked about, hippo, is that camels, both camels and llamas, have been domesticated. Do you guys know what that means? No. Domesticated means humans took the animals and basically got them used to being part of human society, which means that humans use them for various purposes, and the animals depend on the humans uh, for food and to live, and really could not survive without humans. So do you know any other animals which are domesticated? Horses. Dogs, horses, right? Bunnies? All the animals that you find on a farm. So cows, Chicken. chickens, cats. sheep, goats, cats are all domesticated cows. animals. Right. So um, this happened actually like 5,000 years ago. So a really long time ago, before even people started writing things down, they had already domesticated camels and they had very important purposes in Arabia and in North Africa. They used them to ride like horses. They even used them for battle and wars, riding camels. They use their hair to make clothing and tents. They use their meat. They ate the camels. They drank their milk. So camels have a very, very important part in the human history in Arabia, North Africa, and Central Asia. And uh, llamas, which are the descendants of camels that live in South America, are also domesticated. Remember, we talked about the four different kinds of llamas. In fact, llamas and alpacas are basically the domesticated descendants of the other two kinds of 
llamas, which are wild, which are called vicuñas and guanacos, which most people have never even heard of those. But llamas and alpacas are basically the domesticated versions of those animals. So you can't have wild llamas or wild alpacas. Um, so um, they are uh, very important for the native indigenous people of the northern part of South America in Peru and Ecuador. Uh, they also have adaptations, but they live at high altitude. And what happens in high altitude, in other words, in the mountains, is that the oxygen is thinner and you need special blood to survive because you need more red blood cells to carry oxygen. So llamas in that part of the world, in the mountains in South America, actually have thicker blood uh, because they have more red blood cells than other animals to carry the oxygen that they need to live. And, um, but they also have uh, to retain water because there's not much water in that environment. They have long, very long intestines. The intestine is where water is brought back into the body. So theirs are, are, happen to be a lot longer than other animals. So let's just watch one last video about llamas, five things you didn't know about llamas. Okay, I'm in my khakis, Christine. We've got llamas behind us. They're furry and woolly and awesome. We came to Wildlife World Zoo in Phoenix, Arizona to learn all about these fluffy guys. Starting with the llama mamas. They are pregnant for nearly a year at 350 days. Wait, so one of these llamas is carrying a baby llama for a year. Yes. And baby llamas, also called crias, are born weighing between 20 and 35 pounds. They're jumping around same day that they're born. It's pretty amazing. Nothing like a human baby. Next, their cousin is the spitting camel. When you talk about the baby llamas, oops, the llama just sneezed and I thought it was actually angry and spitting. <laughs> the urban legend is that camels will spit at you. What about llamas? Okay, so llamas definitely do the same. Okay, because we're really close. The good news is they only do it when they're agitated. Usually they'll just spit at each other. The third thing you didn't know about llamas, they are often confused with alpacas, but Christy says alpacas are a little different. Friend, their fur is a little bit softer, their face is a little bit shorter, and uh, their ears aren't quite as big. To me, they look like a giant standard poodle. They're so fluffy. <laughs> Next, llamas are super strong. It can get up to 450 pounds, and a llama can pack around a quarter of its body weight and trek 10 to 12 miles, no problem. Llamas are also fast. These two made national news in Phoenix, Arizona. I remember in 2015, there was a llama that went on in this wild chase and like jumped over its fence. Llamas are really quick. And finally, they can be extremely protective. I mean, who needs a guard dog when you have a guard llama? So it's a llama that's armed with its really unique adaptations of very heightened smell, eyesight, and hearing. Which makes it easy for them to detect predators and alert the others. They are amazing, and everyone's really starting to find out just how amazing these creatures are. That's five things you didn't know about llamas. All right, so guys, the things I want you to remember from this, camels, the ancestors of camels and llamas actually first appeared in North America, even though there are none left in North America now. Um, the ancestors of camels went in the west direction and ended up in Asia and then ultimately in North Africa. The ancestors of llamas went south and ended up in the mountains of South America, um, that camels can are divided into one hump, which are dromedaries, two humps, which are in Asia, Bactrian camels. Camels are incredibly well adapted to the desert, hot, dry environment with many different special mechanisms in their bodies for holding onto water, holding onto food, and being able to replace water in their bodies very quickly when they get a uh, chance. Can llamas do that? Uh, llamas do not have the same issues with water, probably to some degree, but not as much as camels. So llamas do not have humps. 
and they do not have the same degree because it's not as hot. So they don't lose as much water as camels. All right, guys. Okay. So that's it. Camels and llamas. Bye-bye.